Hello, I'm Gal Sela, a PhD student in the Technion, and I'm going to present a work done with Erez Petrank. Our work is on concurrent data structures for non-volatile memory. We designed the most efficient FIFO queues for non-volatile memory. We achieved excellent performance by satisfying two optimal properties. In a first amendment to durable queues, we reduced the expensive blocking persist instructions to the minimum theoretically possible. In the Second Amendment, we additionally eliminated accesses to data flushed from the cache to the memory. Thanks to these optimal durability properties, our Second Amendment queues are the best performing durable queues existing today. They perform more than twice faster than previous implementations in most of the workloads we measured. To understand the context of our, our work, let's start with the model. The classical memory hierarchy includes registers, caches, DRAM as main memory, and hard disk or SSD as a secondary storage. In case of a power outage, all content is lost except for the content in the disk. That's why data needs to be serialized to the disk for it to survive crashes. Recent technological advances introduced the non-volatile RAM as a persistent replacement for the DRAM. Data structures may be reconstructed from the data kept in the NVRAM, avoiding expensive accesses to the disk. NVRAM is not only persistent, but also fast, large, and byte addressable. So why not simply use existing data structure implementations with NVRAM as they are? That's because they cannot be reconstructed from the memory that easily. We need to make some adjustments. Let's see why. Imagine a data structure writing one to some memory location, then two to another location, then three. In case of cache misses, the CPU is free to evict data from the cache in order to make room for other data. Thus, the cache line containing two might be evicted before the cache line containing one is written to the memory. In case of a power outage, we might end up with an inconsistent state of the data structure in the memory. Two appears in the memory, while one does not. Although two might depend on one and witnessing only the right of two without one might reflect an illegal state of the data structure. As I've demonstrated, the content of the cache is lost in a crash, so we might face an inconsistent state after a crash. We need to adjust data structure implementation to enable recovery after a crash based on the surviving data in memory. We deal with the reordering of writes in memory using explicit flushes. After placing asynchronous flush instructions, we need to place a blocking fence in order to make sure that the flushes complete. We don't want to place flush and fence after every memory access since fences are blocking and will slow us down. But we must use at least one fence per update operation. This was shown by Cohen et al. that a durably linearizable log-free object must use at least one fence per update operation. They also presented the universal construction that achieves this bond, thus proving it is tight. Yet the universal construction is slow as it is meant to prove an upper bound and not to provide good performance. We aim to improve performance by designing tailor-made implementations with the minimum fences. Note that Cohen et al. referred to durably linearizable log-free objects and our queues also have these properties of durable linearizability and log freedom. To recap our motivation, the CPU performs cache evictions that implicitly flush data to the memory. They reorder writes to memory so that in case of a system crash, some new data may appear in the environment while older data kept in the cache is lost. 
a consistent view of the data structure might be achieved using flushes and fences, but fences are slow. Our goal is to adjust concurrent data structures to use the environ for persistence and use minimum fences for improving performance. We focus on FIFO queues. As a first contribution, we design queues with the minimum number of fences possible, which is one fence per instruction, per operation. We minimize the number of fences using various methods. Here is a glimpse to some of them, on which I will also expand, expand more later. To link data without first persisting it, we use a validity bit to indicate if a linked data is not yet valid and should be ignored. Another adjustment required to enable linking unflushed data is assisting concurrent operations. An operation helps to persist operations it, it depends on for making sure that the operation itself is fully persistent. An additional technique for reducing fences is piggybacking non-urgent flushes on later fences that are executed by later operations. More methods to eliminate fences appear in the paper. When we implemented our queues on a platform with Intel Obtain Environ, we were surprised to witness comparable performance to the state-of-the-art durable queue. We expected a significant improvement since the state-of-the-art durable queue uses more fences. Further investigations raised an interesting problem. Our queues frequently access flushed cache lines, and these accesses significantly deteriorated performance. It turned out that Intel's flush instruction, CLWB, cache line writeback, not only flushes the cache line, but also evicts it from the cache, so that subsequent accesses yield cache misses and reread the data from memory. We note that the Intel manual states that CFWB may retain the line in cache, and this might be implemented in new generations of CPUs. In any case, CPUs that evict cache lines when flushing them led us to the following design guideline. Accesses to flushed cache lines should be reduced. We show in the paper that any object may be implemented in a durable lock-free way with zero accesses to flushed cache lines. We proceeded to design optimal queues. Our second amendment queues incur a single fence per operation like our first amendment queues, and in addition, they perform minimum accesses to flushed data. This improves the performance significantly and makes them not only theoretically optimal, but also the most efficient durable queues in practice. In this second amendment, we eliminated accesses to flushed data in various ways. One idea we use is duplicating data to two copies. We write bo to both of them, but then we persist one of them and later read only the other copy. The persisted copy will be used in recovery from a crash. Based on this idea and additional methods, some of which are listed here, we eliminate all accesses to flushed data. Further details about these Second Amendment queues appear in the paper. To conclude our contributions, we designed a First Amendment to durable queues, which incurs minimum fences. Minimizing the fences did not yield the expected performance improvement because the CPU evicts cache lines when flushing them. This led us to form a guideline of minimizing access to flushed data. Following this guideline, we proceeded to a second amendment, which not only places minimum fences, but rather also does not access flushed data. As I will later show, this second amendment yields queues with the best performance. I will now detail about the design of the first amendment. The first amendment queues stand on their own, 
as they may turn out best for potential more advanced platforms that might provide flushing without cache eviction. I will not have the time to extend on the Second Amendment queues, which are built on top of the First Amendment queues, but you're welcome to read about them in the paper. So let me now focus on the design of one of the First Amendment queues called linked queue. I will expand on the method to minimize fences usage, which I've skimmed over earlier. First, I will describe how unflushed data may be linked. Assume this is the state of the queue in a certain moment when it contains one node. On the top, we see the volatile coherent view, which reflects the values in the combined view of the caches and the memory. And the bottom part shows only the values that reached the memory. When Lisa and queues, she first allocates a node. She then initializes its data and links it to the queue. Due to write reordering in Enviram, the node's data may not yet reach the memory while the link might be already flushed to the memory. If a crash occurs at this point, then after the crash, we might reconstruct a queue containing garbage. To solve this, we rely on the property that flushes of content from the cache to the memory occur at cache line granularity. Therefore, each writeback of a cache line to the memory reflects a prefix of the writes to that cache line. So within a cache line, the memory preserves the order of writes. Order preservation within cache line boundaries presents the opportunity to place a validity bit that would indicate whether the rest of the cache line is initialized. If we wrote only part of the data and have not yet set the valid bit, then the valid bit in the NVRAM will be definitely unset and indicate that the cache line's content is still invalid. On the other hand, if the valid bit in the NVRAM is set, then the cache line's content is surely initialized. We utilize the validity bit idea in our queue. Let's assume that a queue node is contained in a cache line. If it isn't, then an extension of the validity scheme may be used. Here you look at a queue with a single node. We place a valid bit in the node to indicate if the node is initialized. When Lisa and queues, she initializes the content of the node and only afterwards sets the valid bit. It is fine if the node with the stale content is linked to the queue in the memory, since if a crash occurs, the unset valid bit will indicate that this node should be ignored and the queue will be reconstructed without it. One thing that's missing to complete the picture is making sure that nodes are allocated with an unset valid bit. I will cover this a bit later. But now I want to address another problem within queue operation. If I execute an enqueue concurrently with other enqueues, my node might get discarded. Let's see how that might happen. Lisa might perform an enqueue and complete it except for flushing the link to her node. In the meantime, other Simpsons may enqueue more nodes. If a crash occurs now, the nodes that Bart and Homer finished and queuing will be discarded along with Lisa's node. To prevent this, each and queue should make sure that nodes of preceding and queues are persistent so that there is a persistent chain of nodes leading to its own node. We add backward links to the nodes in order to apply an optimization of persisting only nodes of concurrent and queues and not all nodes of the queue. We elaborate on that on the, in the paper. Now let's get back to where we left off earlier when we discussed the valid bit. I need to explain how nodes are allocated with an unset valid bit. This concerns the dequeue operation, which is responsible to reclaim dequeued nodes. The dequeue does not persist the unset valid bit of its reclaimed node on its own. 
Instead, it piggybacks on a following the queue to help it with the persistence. This happens as follows. Assume Maggie performs a dequeue and extracts the first node from the queue. She then unsets the valid bit of the extracted node in order to reclaim it in an appropriate state. Maggie cannot persist the unset valid bit since she has already placed one fence earlier to persist her dequeue. Instead of placing an additional fence, a second fence, and breaking the optimality of minimum fences, Maggie piggybacks on a fence of a later dequeue that would persist the unset valid and then finally reclaim the node. This also requires to handle memory management using a pool from which nodes are allocated and to which they are returned. I have skimmed over the first amendment queues, but as I've said before, a second amendment on top of them was required to achieve improved performance. I encourage you to read the details of the second amendment in the paper. I will now show our evaluation that demonstrates the de facto benefit of the second amendment. We implemented the queues in C++ and used a variation of epoch-based epoch reclamation called SSMEM. We ran our experiments on a Linux machine with two Intel Xeon Cascade Lake CPUs, each with eight cores, and with an Intel Optane NVRAM of one and a half terabytes. The graph shows the throughput of the different queue algorithms when randomly executing NQs and the queues. The X axis indicates the number of threads operating in the experiment. The Y axis indicates throughput, namely how many operations the threads performed per second overall in million operations. Higher is better. So these two lines, uh, they measure our two second amendment algorithms. These blue and green lines measure our first uh, amendment algorithms. The purple line measures a queue variant based on the state-of-the-art durable queue of Friedman et al, which is the most efficient existing durable queue. We implemented the faster variant of Friedman's queue without detectability to compare it fairly to our queues. And in the end, these lines uh, they measure transactional memory queues and universal constructions, which performed worse. The baseline algorithm in the purple line performs more than a single fence per operation, and yet the First Amendment queues perform similarly, although they perform the minimum number of fences possible. We attribute that to their many accesses to flushed content. The Second Amendment queues, which access no flushed data, enable to benefit from minimizing the fences, and indeed they yield the best performance. For example, for six threads, one of the Second Amendment variations performs three times faster than the First Amendment queues and the state-of-the-art queue. In the paper, we present evaluation of additional workloads. All of them are clearly dominated by the Second Amendment queues. This supports our guideline of minimizing not only blocking fences, but also access to flushed data. The evaluation endorses the Second Amendment queues as the best durable queues, both in their theoretical properties and in their practical performance. For more details, you may refer to the conference paper and to the full version on archive. Thank you for listening.